Welcome to My Financial Coach Live. Good afternoon, Don. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thank you. All right, excellent. So we've been reaching out to a few of our subject matter experts. And one of the things that we're doing is a little bit of background is to compile a list of questions that some of our wealthier listeners have, and they've always wanted some informative help. Uh, so what I'd like you to do is perhaps give our listeners a little bit of background on yourself first. Sure. Um, I have been in the executive benefits business for over 25 years. I have worked with a variety of different types of companies, mm -hmm. uh, being you know, for-profit, publicly traded. I would say probably my biggest uh, sector of experience has been in the nonprofit area, um, mm -hmm. a lot with uh, organizations such as credit unions, trade associations, universities, uh, all sorts of uh, nonprofit organizations to help them mm -hmm. attract, retain, reward uh, key people. All right. Excellent. So, Don, let me set the stage for you. Uh, imagine one of the people that you know, you've been working with now for 10, 20 years. Uh, they reach out to you, and, and they're just frustrated. They said, hey, I just lost another director of marketing to that startup that's eating my dinner. I gave them all a 5% bonus last year and a 2% raise. It never seems enough. Uh, why can't I seem to keep my star guys? Uh, so what this client is asking is, hey, how do I keep my most valuable employees working hard? Uh, how would you answer that question or, or maybe approach the scenario? Well, I think the approach might be the better way of, of thinking about it in the sense that every company has unique qualities. And so certainly there could be some situations uh, mm -hmm. that are happening at this organization that might make it more prone to folks leaving, you know, could be culture, et cetera. But with that said, uh, I think there are certainly commonalities as well that a lot of companies have. And I think what I would want to do is find out, um, you know, what kind of a structure do they have when it comes to their compensation, when it comes to their benefits, you know, what is their communication strategy, um, and kind of looking at those, well, how, how are they positioning themselves when it comes to people that they're, they're senior people, they're key people in their organization. Uh, so I think that would be a good first step in the process. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so let's dig into that a, a, a little bit more. This person obviously has, is having trouble retaining star employees. What, what are some of the things that, that this person could have maybe taken a look at to, to help retain those employees, uh, whether that's, that's financially? I mean, it looks like he gave them all a raise, but money didn't seem to be a, a really motivating factor here. Well, studies show that money is is uh, not often a the primary focus. It's certainly a big focus, um, but people want other things. They want uh, praise. They want recognition. And then when it comes to the financial side, they want the ability to share in some way, shape, or form in the upside, the growth of the organization. Now, in many organizations, um, it's just not possible that people could be an actual owner, so there are vehicles that can um, help people uh, accommodate or adjust for this, you know, things such as uh, long-term incentive plans or phantom stock arrangements, uh, deferred compensation arrangements are just a few of those items. Also, the uh, organization, and this is all part of a exploration process that you'd mm -hmm. want to do within an engagement, but the organization can also, if appropriate, set up, uh, at, you know, retention-oriented retention, retention -oriented types of, of uh, plan designs, so something that will really reward uh, folks who stick around for the long run. Or uh, if someone's saying, you know, we're not growing the way we want to grow, you mm -hmm. can even performance-based instruments. Those would just be a couple of ideas that are out there. Okay, so for the benefit of our listeners, could you maybe just highlight one or two that you've seen work really well in the past? Sure. Uh, I think uh, uh, phantom stock programs or long-term incentive programs can work well as an alternative to ownership. Um, I think oftentimes, uh, especially in a small company, and I've, I've experienced this personally in a company I worked with where although I was a minority owner, we had others who weren't, and they were on long-term incentive plans, so it can give people the feel that they're going to be 
involved and be a partner in what's happening with the company and the growth that it's experienced. So I think I think that's one certainly one way of doing it. Um, another way, which is more retention focused, can be to, as I mentioned, in programs where there's a, a very significant mm -hmm. reward uh, over the time frame that someone is, uh, you know, looking to work, or someone or the organization would want them to work there. So let's say it's seven or eight or nine years. Uh, you've got a significant carrot out there that that person is working towards. Gotcha. So. If you were, were to give us maybe, uh, without sharing too many details uh, that are private and confidential, could you give us a, an example of a time where you were able to maybe put one of these programs in place and the effect that it had on retention? We had a, a situation, this was three or four years ago, where a, an entrepreneur, a young lady, had started a company, uh, and she had done pretty well. She had gotten the company up to 2 or $3 million dollars. And, but she was very much of a creative, which I think mm -hmm. is left brain, if I'm not mistaken. She felt like she wasn't going to be able to really get this to the next step. So uh, an entrepreneur, um, serial entrepreneur, uh, approached her and offered to purchase her company, um, which she accepted. But he then had a challenge, and that is he needed to retain uh, this young lady plus two other key employees in order for, to make the company really run uh, effectively and to grow because he was not uh, a day-to-day -day type of person, particularly in this industry. So uh, we engaged, or I should say the, the owner engaged us. We went through a process of plan design, and we ended up putting in a phantom stock arrangement. And not only has the retention stayed true to what the goal was, which was uh, at least 10 years for each of these individuals so far, but the growth of the company has been spectacular. Uh, the company is now, the last I checked, I think approaching $20 million in revenue, in, you know, in just a matter of four years, starting from about three or four million. So it's really been quite a success story, and I think the the message and the communication of the program have played a role in that process. Okay, that's that's actually very interesting that that, that you mentioned education. Could you maybe tell us a little bit more about why some of these plans may need that additional layer of education? Well, I think there's a couple reasons. First of all, I would say about any program you have, benefit program or for that matter, compensation program, it's a good idea to make sure that people understand it. You know, we live in, uh, in a you know, great world these days, but in, we also have a lot of choices and there can be a lot of complexity. So people, I don't think, automatically understand even common benefits such as health insurance, uh, mm -hmm. for example, or 401Ks, and they, they even less understand things that are not quite as common such as deferred compensation arrangements, phantom stock uh, programs, long-term incentive programs, et cetera. So I think that's a really uh, key reason why you would want to do this. And it also helps people understand the value. Uh, you were mentioning earlier that uh, you know a company – in the story you were saying, where he was giving raises, but they people were leaving anyway. And without knowing anything specific about that situation, one of the questions I would pose would be, how did you communicate those raises? Uh, how did people earn those raises? You know, what were the circumstances around the raises? So communication is a very important element here uh, in, in terms of any plan you put in, but again, especially programs that are not as common in the marketplace. I see. Okay. So actually, that's a good good point. So oftentimes, whenever an employer is communicating with their top employees, they may be stakeholders, they may not be. But let's say that in this specific case, they, they aren't stakeholders. Uh, the way to make someone feel that there is a long-term financial incentive with the company could be one strategy. Uh, but you're, you're, you're saying here that a lot of it is communication. So have you found that often when you're working with an employer, they really don't know what their top employees want? Or would you say that they know it's just that they're not quite sure uh, how to find the right solutions for them? Or, or what, what, what do you see that's common in the marketplace? Well, I would say – Probably more of the people who don't know exactly what uh, the employees want 
although there are other situations uh, similar to the uh, other alternative you mentioned. But one of the tools that we often use at the beginning of a process for just this purpose um, is after we've asked some questions to say, okay, what, what kind of uh, things are you hearing from the employees or the key employees? And when people don't know is we suggest that they might use a survey uh, to find out exactly what people are thinking about. That's a, a very effective uh, tool to use, particularly early in the process when we're starting to think about uh, how to solve a certain problem. So I think it helps to find what a challenge or problem that they may have and it also, uh, no other reason, it can help you know, bolster uh, communication strategy going forward. Okay, that sounds like a lot of work. Do you feel that maybe sometimes employers kind of give up and say, hey, uh, this is just a huge waste of my time? What, what would you say to that employer if they, they're kind of not sold on the, hey, let's do some research? Well, I'd say a couple things. First of all, it doesn't have to be a lot of work. Uh, I suppose it would be if, if you were trying to do it on your own with the 10, 15, or 20 other things that most employers slash owners have to deal with. But if you use uh, a firm such as ours who has a lot of experience in this area, uh, that can certainly uh, lighten up the load. The other comment that I would make there is think about the cost of turnover in the organization. And to go back to your example at the outset of this discussion, with the uh, significant turnover that this person was having, um, the cost would be uh, immense. Mm -hmm. And I think in most of, most organizations we work with, the uh, your personnel are really one of the key components, if not the key component in the company. So I think it's uh, worth an investment to have your key people uh, and your, one of the key components that are driving growth in your company uh, to address those needs. Well, Don, I want to thank you so much for your time. You've given us a lot to think about and ponder. Well, thank you. I enjoyed the opportunity to speak with you. All right. Thank you, Don. Have a good day.